All right, well, welcome everybody, and we're starting in Mark chapter 2, and we'll see how far we get today. Good. So, I'll Christy, read. yeah. Should I stop after the paralytic? Since that's sure. what we just yeah. talked about. Okay. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up, and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Now, I do have to wonder, I mean, if Jesus is giving a presentation, or I mean, to sp speaking to the people in this building, and then people start digging the roof out from above him, I mean, that kind of would be an interruption to whatever he's saying. Back it up, A, to get away from the debris. I mean, <laughs> next thing you know, the way they're digging through that uh, roof, they could very well fall through it for all. I mean, I don't know, but... Uh, and then they open it wide enough for them to lower this man. I mean, they'd have to dig a pretty large hole. How long would that take? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know if there would be... Maybe there was... Kind of roof construction. The way they des <laughs> describe it, it's not like there was maybe a skylight that could have been opened or something. Mm -hmm. they, they had to actually dig through the roof, so hmm. I'm just... And how do you carry a paralyzed man up to a roof? Like, the whole thing just was amazing. Even if there's, tackle, yeah, if there's... Yeah, if there's an emergency ex exit if the, if the... I mean, since they had flat roofs, I'm sure they maybe used some of the space above on, at, on nice days as a patio or something, but uh, then the roof had to be all stronger, so... Mm -hmm. I mean, how long would he be waiting just for them to finish opening the roof? It's like, what's going on there? Before he said, <laughs> someone around and say, you know, stop those vandals from uh, breaking through this roof. We kind of need that. Yeah. It's going to rain <laughs> later on. Maybe. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. There was a chimney opening that they uh, uncovered. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I just wonder about that. It's interesting because we read stories and then when we actually see them acted out sometimes, we're aware of the time and even intimacy and different things. Like I, I've shared before the, the story of the woman who anoints Jesus' feet and then uses her hair. Mm -hmm. You act that out and everyone gets really uncomfortable because you realize the intimacy of the action. Um, same with when Jesus makes a whip. He just sits there and braids and braids and braids. And you realize what an intentional act it is for him to use the whip in the temple. Um, so, yeah, it is interesting to think about. There's all sorts of other time and visual and sound. And, and it also, I never thought of this before, but... Why, if they needed that much time to get up on the roof and go down, why couldn't they just have said, excuse me, excuse me, mm -hmm. excuse me? But I'm wondering if people wouldn't let him through because why are you bringing this worthless guy to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that mm -hmm. part I can fathom uh, with their, I mean, from what we've talked about their culture before. Mm -hmm. But just the, someone's breaking through the roof. Should we let them continue, or should we send someone down to uh, <laughs> yeah. stop them from breaking through the roof? And, uh. Well, but think about this. It says, um, they returned to Capernaum, and it was reported he was at home. Now, Jesus was from Nazareth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that was his home base during his ministry. In mm -hmm. fact, some people yeah. have said Capernaum was his home base. Mm -hmm. This could have been his house. 
So he didn't put a stop to it, which is another really interesting thing. Yes. So he's watching them do this, and he's like, I'm going to see how this plays out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to see what's going to happen here. They've never done it before. It's his own house. <laughs> it's his, it, mm-hmm. it could Make very well be his own, own house. house. Um, in some of the other Gospels, they go, uh, they go to, let's see, Galilee. Now I'm forgetting. Is Peter from Capernaum, too? I'm having a moment. Anyway, there seemed to be a home base that wasn't Nazareth. Okay that Jesus seemed to feel comfortable and he kept going back to. Mm -hmm. So, Well, and the faith of those friends, so obviously the whole act, but also if Jesus didn't heal the guy, then he's stuck there and they need to somehow get him out. So they had just assumed that this guy would walk. Yeah. They trusted Jesus. And luring him in a way that he doesn't fall off the Mm -hmm. map. I mean, maybe it was more like a hammock type thing uh, without mm-hmm. a framework mm-hmm. it's just oh, yeah. it'd be yeah. like a bag lowering him down right. until right. Yeah. We're open. Mm-hmm. maybe that'd be a lot safer too but it's just to it'd be really interesting to I mean, we've seen ways that this has been acted out in the mm-hmm. movies and uh, in plays uh, mm-hmm. but how this must have really played out for this the logistics of it yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. so can I this just came to my mind this is something that may I don't know how you guys think about it, but there is a um, a book called Course in Miracles, and it's What's the word a course. Oh, a course. Yeah, like okay. a school course. It's Course in Miracles, and it's been around since the '70s. Very thick thing. Mm-hmm. Only gotten through part of it, but one of the concepts in there, and in in a couple other writings, is that there is. A version of us spiritually that is perfectly healthy and whole always but on earth for various reasons we shift away from that and this perspective was that every time <clears throat> Jesus encountered anyone he saw the version of them that was perfectly healthy and whole and as long as there was something in them that was willing he could pull that out so the fact that the man stood up and walked Jesus was really actually just like shifting the reality almost, you know, to like, okay, we're going to restore you back to the part of you that never got sick in the first place. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? That is. It's interesting. very interesting. And it's also, I don't know if it's in this gospel, but there's a part where like people have the lack of faith and Jesus could only do a few healings. Mm-hmm. And that sort of is an interesting thing where there's there might be a part of you that's not willing to participate in the healing, which is true in general. We know this with therapy. We know this with mm-hmm. physical therapy. If you're not willing to participate in the healing process, it's not going to happen. No one can do it for you. And there may be a level in which Jesus is like, I can see it. I'm going to pull it out. Will you let me? Mm-hmm. Yes or no. Um, and we'll see that with the hemorrhaging woman, how she's just like, mm-hmm. does it for herself. She's mm-hmm. like, I'm gonna. <laughs> so I just I, I see that and I think that's a was a fascinating concept I'd never heard about. Um, it was like all of a sudden his body was taught, no, this is what you really are, and then the body adjusted and could walk again. Hmm. Well, we know um, we, we know someone who was, who was so locked into pain that she was um, she had a hard time using um, her legs for a time and she had to relearn to not be feeling pain through um, physical therapy and uh, I mean, it, I mean it, it was described to us as uh, basically she had been pained for so long that the circuit breaker got kind of stuck in yes. her head and she had to mm-hmm. basically teach herself that yes um, her leg is perfectly fine and uh, kind of unlearn that whole uh, reactionary um, stance of, like, yeah. or maybe it's a case of I mean, it's hard to tell if it's, she was actually physically feeling the pain or if it was just the body trying to, he doesn't want to use the leg because it's expecting the pain. But exactly. But have the faith in Jesus to um, know that, yeah, I can step now and won't not feel a pain. Um, and lo and behold, yeah, there is no pain there. Who knew? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the hemorrhaging and some of these overtly physical um things I mean that's 
quite another um, thing where it's not just a mm-hmm. leap of faith, it's the body it. really yeah. um, responding physically to yeah. Jesus. So. Yeah. Okay, should I go on? Yeah. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors... They said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Hmm. So back to the sinners one. Mm-hmm. What did they mean when they were saying sinners? Like the tax collectors and sinners. Like were these the bad people? Were these, what What were they? Gentiles? Like what? I don't think they were Gentiles, but I think they would qualify as people who were not okay with... The religious order. Okay. So maybe they weren't. Maybe they weren't following the rules. They weren't following okay. the rules. They may have chosen a profession, or they might be. There was something that they were or weren't doing. Okay. Uh, according to the law. So. It's not just people who made little screw ups, but people who done something overtly bad that the people in the community were looking down on. Mm. It was. It's sort of like the the whole way of life, the whole Jewish way of life at that time involved rituals and involved traditions and following the law and if you mm-hmm. were somebody who just didn't do that you'd probably mm-hmm. be cons- considered a sinner okay so maybe like they didn't circumcise or they didn't do one of these things okay they didn't do they ritual didn't. washings they didn't go to synagogue they got it so then they are sinners uh, okay. mm-hmm. pastor scott had explained uh, that in those days the tax collectors were the lowest of low, out, kind of outcasts of this, it could because really they were seen as traitors yeah. um, mm-hmm. to the Jewish people. Yeah. They traitors, were yeah. um, now collecting taxes for the Romans mm-hmm. from the Jews. Uh, so they were, I mean, ostracized mm-hmm. and uh, effectively shunned by the community. But here Jesus is eating with them and uh, they say other seniors, so it could have brought in um, other outcasts. Uh, like the lepers and prostitutes and mm-hmm. um, who knows who else. Mm-hmm. Um, but people that we know Jesus had re- relations with, in- interacted with, in other parts of the Bible too. And, yeah. uh, it just blows their mind because yeah. he was with the unclean people. Yeah. So this is a very interesting point because in this perspective, you know, if you are keep yourself clean, then interaction with something unclean makes you unclean and then you're not okay with God. So it's a whole, a whole oh, perspective yeah. of like being tarnished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet Jesus is coming from a completely different perspective, which is like, look, if you are fine with the way things are and you're moving along fine, then you don't need me. But there are people who are not okay, and they're the ones that need me. Uh, it's like 
a physician goes to the sick people, not the well people. So Jesus is going to the people who've been ostracized, the people who've been cast out, things mm -hmm. like that, because they're the ones that need to hear what he has to say. And But these two world perspectives don't work very well. And I'm thinking about how there are, <clears throat> still to this day, Christian communities that are very, 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 very strict, mm -hmm. um, kind of culty in a little way. And a lot of what it is is we have to be separate from the world. Mm -hmm. We have the truth. We're doing things the right way. And there's this fear of being tarnished by the ideas and the beliefs of other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is why, you know, they, you can't watch certain movies, you can't watch TV, you can't, um, you have to dress and look differently so people know you're different and they kind of leave you alone. Um, and in some ways I understand that perspective because it's working so hard to keep you okay. Mm -hmm. But it's completely missing the big picture of love and compassion and mm -hmm. the fact that those people are not your enemy. They're not bad. They're not tarnished. And to be honest, if you are strong enough in your own faith, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to get tarnished by them. You will impact them versus they will impact you. Or maybe you will share something that's both beneficial. Hmm. Um, yeah. And we see this continue to happen with Jesus. Is he's coming at it from a completely different worldview. Which is, to me, the wine and the wineskins thing is always a little heartbreaking in that if you're so used to seeing the world in a certain way and it for the most part works for you and someone brings new ideas and fresh things hmm. you may not always be open to that and I, I think that's why there are so many different kinds of churches and why churches might splinter mm -hmm. is that Sometimes it's a disagreement, but sometimes it's a, come on in. Your spot's open, John. Got my spot. Sometimes it's just, you don't want to change. You don't want to learn something new. And so, mm -hmm. you know, instead of adapting and adjusting for the new, there's a splintering and a breaking that happens, and that happens in churches, that happens in, in all, all sorts of things. Um, so I think Jesus is realizing to some degree that he's bringing this rich, beautiful wine as a metaphor, and the mm -hmm. old religious order cannot contain it. So, and that must be kind of heartbreaking him mm -hmm. to realize that they they're not going to be able to understand where he's coming from yeah there's that old expression you can't teach an old dog new tricks although many um older folks will quite proudly yeah. <laughs> um absolutely de demonstrate that is not the case exactly it just takes more patience yeah well Sometimes yes, sometimes no even. Nothing I mean, with the older dogs. Usually it does take a little more patience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do need to unlearn something in the course of it. We talked a little bit about that whole needing to unlearn some things. That's why he was taking, last week I think it was, or the week before, where needing to unlearn it. Um, so we, Jesus was taking mm -hmm. minds that he felt was open enough to, to be receptive to his newer teachings. But at the same time, it's I mean, those who won't listen to some of these newer perspectives kind of miss out mm -hmm. well it's a mindset yeah of, of being open and learning I think um, and things are changing uh, my husband and I started watching Northern Exposure do you guys remember that oh, show from the 90s goodness. yeah I remember my parents watching it but at that time I was young enough that this was an old Christian show <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm watching it now I'm watching it and and there was, we're just in the second episode, but the guy who does the radio station was going to read some Walt Whitman and, and made the mistake of saying that Walt Whitman may have been gay. And he just simply said that, and then he said that um, that made him rethink, because he loves Walt Whitman, that made him rethink all the gay kids he bullied in school. And it was just this offhand comment. Mm -hmm. And he proceeds to read Walt Whitman. Well, the guy who owns the station, who's sort of this conservative, like, kind of navy guy rushes in and like 
punches him <laughs> and Dude. takes over. And you don't realize till the end when he gets up and gives a ha- heartfelt talk that for him, that was taking a hero and slandering him offhanded. Sure. And I can understand that perspective, but that didn't age well. Because calling someone gay is not an insult. <laughs> no. yeah. But, but that's a change then. in culture. Yeah. It's yeah. a huge change in culture. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say about this, because I've been talking a lot. It used to be if you say, that's gay, mm-hmm. that that was an insult. Mm-hmm. But now young kids are using that, ironically, because it's not bad to be gay. So they'll see something that's gay and they'll go, that's so gay. Because they're just naming what it is and it's, they're not ashamed of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's like when you've yeah, reclaimed a word. They're like, that's so gay because it's gay. Well, it's, gay <laughs> it's, for, it's for what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gay used to be happy. Yeah. It used to be, yeah. Yeah. Happy. Happy. Mm-hmm. happy. That's fine. It should have mm-hmm. always stayed happy. My Marie's name is, my wife's name is gay. Mm-hmm. Her maiden name is gay? Her, her, no, that's her first name. Oh. Real, real first oh, name. real first Gay name. Marie. Okay. Mm. With an E on the end? G-A-Y-E? Yeah, I've seen no, that name. no. Just G-A-Y-E. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's a lovely name. Mm-hmm. That yeah. is interesting. And her sister's name was Joy, and the other one is M-E-R-R-Y. Oh. Oh, oh. happy. Yeah. Huh. That's why. Yeah. Uh, is that why she goes by Marie? She... She, uh, in the 70s, switched it yeah. over a little mm-hmm. bit to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Nice. Should I read more? But so the last one you were reading, what, what, that didn't have to do with uh, wineskins, did it? Oh, uh, wineskins yeah. were written. Okay, we that, that, that. Yeah, we're chapter two. Yep, we're reading chapter two. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead keep reading. Okay. Where are we? Chapter three. three. Yeah. yeah. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, "Come forward." Then he said to them, "Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill?" But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, "Stretch out your hand." He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him. Hearing all that he was doing, they came to him in great numbers from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crush him. For he had cured many, so that all who had diseases pressed upon him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, You are the Son of God. But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. Hmm. He went up the mountain and called to him those whom he wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, and to be sent out to proclaim the message, and to have authority to cast out demons. So he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, never heard that, that is, son of sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaan, Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay. How do you pronounce that? Do you know? Oh, the bow energy? I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. All right. We'll yeah. say thunder. There we go. Sons <laughs> of thunder. I don't think it comes up again, so we're okay. It's interesting that he gave uh, special names to mm-hmm. um, Simon and uh, to and. The brothers it sounds like it was a nickname because these maybe these guys are two raucous brothers and mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> but the other guys you guys are your guys' names fit you well enough. I'm right. just gonna or I'm I'm out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. I'm only human. Well, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those names too came over time. Like there's this joke. Mm-hmm. 
That's true. There's like a cartoon where Jesus goes, hey, come and follow me. Also, your name is Peter. <laughs> it's like they have this instantaneous, you know, it makes more sense that since this is written retrospectively, that in the years they had together, Jesus continued to refer to someone by a certain name, and that's what their name became. I think I recall from one of your books there was a, um, a point at which uh, Jesus even commented to, um, to him that I will call you Peter, for you are my rock. rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And at some point, these guys, these maybe these brothers got into some sort of argument, or just got, had, mm-hmm. had a little too much wine one day, and Jesus yeah. <laughs> called them the brothers of thunder, and it yeah. stuck with Mark. <laughs> Something, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. So we're seeing in Mark, very early on, a a splintering between what the way Jesus is doing things and all of the different religious leaders. Mm-hmm. And the conspiracy, I mean, we're only in cha- right. chapter three. They already three. want to kill him. They already want to kill him. So we're seeing that splinter Let's happen. Load that Chekhov's gun. <laughs> yes. We're seeing Jesus be, you know, lots of action, lots of things happening as he's moving around. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that's pretty famous for Mark is the disciples have no idea. They don't really get it ever. In fact, nobody really gets it, which is um, the whole only the demons recognize Jesus for what he is. And he keeps saying, like, don't don't tell anyone to everybody because I think it's sort of a, a perspective of, A, people are going to have the wrong idea. They're going to be like, oh, he's the Messiah, and therefore you're mm. going to be like my king, the next King David. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing that Jesus, why he doesn't want them like going around talking about him, is it's not about him. He's not here mm-hmm. to get millions of followers. He's not here to with this Instagram account. He's not, that's not what it's about. He's revealing, it's about his message. It's about what he's revealing about God. And he doesn't necessarily need to be an icon. That's what I think. Is So every time people are like, you're the son of God, you're the Messiah. And he's like, about that not about that like that's don't don't talk that way it's going to divert what I'm trying to do and everyone's just going to try to praise me instead of embodying the message Mm. that I'm trying to share he knows at the moment they know who he is they'll stop listening to him and they'll just start praising him Hmm. and we still see that a lot today oh yeah (laughs) oh my goodness yes Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have all heard this, but this is a big thing that came out a couple months ago where there was a convergence of evangelical pastors and someone started reading the Beatitudes and other people were like, where are you getting those woke socialist points? <laughs> and like, this is, this is from the Bible, like, literally exactly Jesus. <laughs> and then, and then like true. pastors were commiserating on the fact that they couldn't even preach the Beatitudes, because their congregant members were get up, were getting upset. They were like the frog in boiling water. So much of parts wow. of Christianity have moved away from any of the original teachings to being about power and control and authority. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that that that's more important than anything else. Um, and so they'll come and they'll praise Jesus, but they don't actually want to follow any of his teachings. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Do you want to keep reading? Sure. I'll finish three here. Then he went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. I'm just trying to Mm -hmm. let that, okay. 
Mm-hmm. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Mm-hmm. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He didn't say, Who does my will? Or follow Mm -hmm. me. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, the will of God. That's right. Thank you, John. That was... Spot on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although I must admit, I do kind of feel sorry for his mother and brothers waiting for him outside. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. We kind of want to have a talk with you, uh, yeah. but and he's like, "No, I'm going to take this moment to give yeah. a, a larger you know, <laughs> teaching about how we're all one and how we're all connected." And at then, mom's expense. Exactly. Yeah, at mom's yeah. expense. Yeah. But then, yeah. long suffering. Mary right. must be so used to it, though. When he yes. was ten, mm-hmm. like she couldn't oh, find yeah. the kid. Can you imagine? And he's just, oh, I'm just teaching in my father's house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was going to make some more points. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that she wasn't. <laughs> this hadn't happened to her before. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Yeah. So what what is he getting at with the no one can enter a strong man's house? Hmm. What am I missing? Okay, where is that again? 27. So he's mm-hmm. talking about a house divided against itself can't stand. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So the strong man um, is a metaphor actually for like Satan. Okay. Rather than it being a person. So basically he's saying... Um, you have to okay. bind the strong man in order to get rid of, you so know. So Satan can't get rid of Satan because Satan would need yeah. to be restrained. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. And I Jesus is, yeah, and mm-hmm. Jesus is, through his work, he's basically binding the strong man mm-hmm. so that good work can be done. So, yeah. This to me is, is really, it's, it's fascinating, again, that you can look at somebody who's doing what Jesus is doing and mm-hmm. call it evil. Mm-hmm. You're, you completely miss the point. And you say he has a demon. You say he's out of his mind. And I, I think back in history of, of the times in which this must have happened to women mm-hmm. a lot. Oh, yeah. She's a witch. Uh, yeah, she's a witch. Because they had some insight, some knowledge, some perspective that wasn't, you know... Uh, according to the the way things are Mm -hmm. and you always have gatekeepers of the way things are and they feel very holy calling to their work Um, Mm. and this line about the only kind of the unforgivable sin which is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and the way I understand that is if the movement of the Holy Spirit throughout the whole planet is giving life and freeing and healing and casting off chains and you look at that and you call it evil it's not that God's like well nuts to you I'm going to throw you in hell it's you're already there you've cast yourself out you don't want to be a part of what God's doing so to me this isn't Jesus may be using this as a warning and he might be using that language but that doesn't really fit with like the wise understanding I have of Jesus. His perspective is, you don't want to be a part of what God's doing. But obviously, the minute you change your mind, you're welcome. But if you're that far gone that you call what's good evil, that's very scary. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. when God comes and says, come to heaven be with me, you'll be like, no. Hell no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you... you and so there's, and I really find that a very interesting and compelling idea that we're the ones that remove ourselves. Hmm. We're the mm-hmm. ones who, if you want to be in heaven with God, you get to be in heaven with God. But it's literally one of those things where you, see, if you see it, you believe it. Like you, you go to heaven's gates and you look inside and you're like, wait a minute. There's a lot more diverse people here than I thought. And he's there? Nuts to that. I'm not 
not with Gary or, you know, whatever, <laughs> like that, you know. Steve, you know, whatever it is, you know, he's just like, I think yeah. C.S. Lewis wrote something yeah, Exactly, about exactly. Oh, Pat, this is right in line with Pastor, Sc- uh, to me, what Pastor Scott had said many times as well. So, I mean, you're not the first here to make, make this kind of observation. Mm-hmm. You're, I mm-hmm. think you're spot on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, then, uh, through the years, I, I start picturing, you know, what I see this whole thing as. And I see as that day comes when we get to enter into the glory of God, whatever that is, okay? Mm -hmm. And that can be, it's right here, too. The glory of God's right here. As you say, when the the person says, I do not want that, Mm -hmm. you can eliminate yourself from it. Mm -hmm. And you become that hardened or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, But here or later, you're, you're, you you accept you get to accept that you know and uh, that's and they leave the rest up to God yeah you know do you want it? Uh, yeah it's always been a gift yeah and that's another kind of grace of God is to say have it your way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm not going to hold it against you because you are like those kids in the preschool you still believe there's a monster mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I'm I'm just going to wait here until you realize. There's no monster. That'll be in. That's interesting because what you say there is because, you know, because I always feel like God's always going to have a hand out. Mm-hmm. It always has a hand out. So at the, if there is a judgment day or it's just a judgment time or whatever, we can continue to grow after we die, you know, mm-hmm. in this spiritual moment. Um, that w- if a person rejects God then... Mm-hmm. Will they be able to receive God later? Yeah, I was that, about yeah, that. That's too. interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Because you know. we're thinking about time as linear. Oh, right? we. Mm-hmm. Which is, mm-hmm. always blows my mind that yeah. time is not necessarily linear. So, yeah, will it always be <laughs> open? Like, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that says you have to make a decision for Christ right. before you die. Yeah. There's, I mean, yeah. that language doesn't even exist in the Bible mm-hmm. no. at all. It's, no, not at all. It, it if do. our lives started before we were born and they continue after, mm-hmm. and, and there's eternity after, there's something very special about being on earth that gives us an opportunity to learn and explore in a way that cannot happen on the spiritual realm. Clearly, mm-hmm. you know, that... that this is a very intense place to be. <laughs> um, it's it's like a PhD course in, in spirituality, and yet, if if we fail, we get to take the test again, any time. Mm-hmm. So, and I know that some conservatives this this goes against their belief, and that's fine. They can believe what they want, but I just that doesn't make any sense to me that that would be mm-hmm. any part. Yeah. If if it's not how I in my best and highest version would have created the reality of the world and the universe, why would I give something lesser to God? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nope, this is it. Test is the day you the last breath. Heaven, hell. When, yeah, when, when, really, when you... Uh, I'm sorry, but... Uh, no. One of the when, things that uh, I've kind of uh, been led to believe is that, uh, I mean, when we get to that point, those of us who have been grasping on to um, this, uh, I mean, to either being very self-servant and uh, living life to um, please oneself or looking towards their lineage and their, um, to basically build themselves up in a, um, a, uh, um, a legacy, um, and they get to the end and uh, they finally see that, uh, it's all for naught, or um, they kind of set themselves up to not be able to relate well with others. Um, they're going to find themselves be very lonely, and that itself may be um, the final That's hell. True. But um, That's very if true. we can, uh, I mean, much of what Jesus has been teaching us is to relate well to others. It's not all about ourselves. If we can lift each other up, we will uh, be much happier for it. Mm-hmm. And to, when we on earth. get to mm-hmm. the end time, we can um, be with those that we love and uh, form new relationships still mm-hmm. with uh, others who are of 
similar mindset to be able to open up and to share with each other, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. that won't be so, so bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of setting ourselves up, and that, but those who cannot bring themselves to open up and uh, love other people uh, without needing something for themselves mm-hmm. out of it, then they're mm-hmm. kind of going to be unable or unwilling to uh, oh, accept that invitation of this other reality of what, being part of Christ, uh, being part of God's domain is. See, I, I, th- I see things as every everything of d- degrees. Mm. We all have that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We all have that. Mm-hmm. Everything's just a matter of yeah. degree. Um, there's no, no sin that somebody... Uh, can think of that I don't have. You know, Maybe it doesn't. already committed in your heart. Like yeah, or, well, however, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. That, that sin doesn't exist, at least not in me. Not, not in, um, you know. And so, so it's just a matter of degrees. And all we can do is thank God for his forgiveness of my degree, that degree, those degrees. Mm-hmm. No. I think that for me, the, the big understanding is like, you're already loved. God loves you so mm-hmm. much that God doesn't want to see you in your a hell of your own creation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, and we're all, like to me, spirituality is a detox, a slow, lifelong detox from the toxicity mm-hmm. of the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And no, so is, yeah. I keep mm-hmm. learning a new way. And it's like, I can't do it all at once. And God knows I can't <sighs> do it all at once. So I, I genuinely see, and I, and I still pray, I'm like, send me the next thing. <laughs> and I never know what it's going to be, but then all of a sudden, things will come into my field, a certain, a certain um, speaker book mm. person, uh, a YouTube channel that's like a, something that I 10 years ago would have rolled my eyes at. Some, you know, my, my spiritual director will say something, and all of a sudden, I'm off in a whole new direction sure. of something that's going to enrich make the world bigger, make my heart bigger, make me have more compassion. But it's like a slow curriculum that God has for me, and I never know what the next course is. And to me, that's so beautiful, and and I can take the course as fast or as slow as I want to. You know, it's a Siri curriculum in this lifetime, and, and that's true for absolutely everybody, and their curriculum looks different, and they can do it as fast or as slow as they want to, but it's a healing process. And so I think Jesus just comes to say, God is in you, and God will show you the path out, the way um, to the truth and light and love and all of that good stuff. Um, it's this beautiful, slow unfolding and freedom and healing and toxicity. But if you say no to that, it's just your detriment. Mm-hmm. It's not because God's going to get you. It's because you're going to stay in the stuckness that you've been in. Do you want mm-hmm. that pie? Do you want that nice dessert? Do you want that gift that God has or not? Mm-hmm. And, and you just keep pushing it away, but you don't get it, you don't get it, you know? Do, yeah. do you want to heal or not? And it's okay yeah. if you say no, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because God will ask you next week and next month and mm-hmm. next year, are you ready to heal? Nope. Nope. I want to stay in this anger. I want to stay in this suffering. Okay. You must need that. It, it must be doing something for you to be angry or to be hurting or to hate people. I'll just wait until you're sick of it and mm-hmm. done with it. You yeah, talk- what you're saying is spot on. Um, well, more than the uh, um, reward of uh, a pirate, and just learning the skill you need to move on. Um, as you were giving the, your sermon, I, um, one of my uh, core thoughts of I mean, God loving us like a father mm-hmm. and trying to teach us like a father. Of, I mean, or a mother. And, or a mother. <laughs> basically, <laughs> this is the way you should, the, the right way you should be doing mm-hmm. things. And... Uh, we, sh- we shouldn't be following the commandments or um, love uh, your neighbor as yourself because you have to, uh, right. but more because <coughs> daddy, mommy say so, and uh, we love our daddy and mommy, and uh, and it's actually the right way to do it, and uh, we just need to come around to recognizing that. And not even because they say to do it. 
Because if we trust them, we know they're only saying it because they know what's in our best interest. Mm -hmm. And so when we say, I, I believe in Jesus, really what we're saying is, I trust mm -hmm. in him. And I trust that his version of reality and that the what he says that's true about humanity and God is the truth. And I'm just trying to get my brain and my heart into his reality. Yeah. And that's what, to me, being a Christian is, is like, oh, my brain's stuck in colonialist patriarchal, you yeah. know, <laughs> racist crap yeah. again. <laughs> okay, I am I trust in Jesus, and so I'm going to, you know, ponder what is what does he feel like in his person when he looks at the world. And I just try to sort of bring myself into that understanding, that compassion, mm -hmm. without judgment, but just to see what it, what would it be like to be in Jesus' skin for mm. five minutes with the way he looks at the oh, world. Boy. Mm -hmm. And if that was what he was trying to teach people, this is what it feels like to be in my skin. This is how I see God. This is how I see other people. Do you get it? Do you? Here's another story. Here's another story. Here's yeah. another healing so that yeah. maybe you'll get I'm it. I'm trying to make them simple for you people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that's kind of what I was, I was emphasizing the, the father aspect because that's the filter. I mean, I am a father, and that's the filter that you know, absolutely. I should. Sure. And yeah, being absolutely. a father, I'm grokking some of what he's trying to I mean, Some of his frustrations. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, yeah. and yeah. Um, role as a mother, mm -hmm. you see the same kind of frustrations. I know you do, Kirsten, and I'm yeah. sure you do too. <laughs> and uh, I mean, as a stepdad, really I'm just evil. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure you could tell us some interesting stories too, Anne. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's just he's trying. He gave us the free will to learn. He gave. A, he didn't just have us programmed out of the blue to. I mean, like butterflies to fly from point A to point B and uh, maybe go through a few different life cycles even on the way. Um, he wants us to learn because he wants us to take care of this place. Mm -hmm. He wants companionship. That, um, Ooh, companionship when, you just said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like Isn't it. Isn't that nice? A God who wants yeah, his friends. creations to be companions. That's when, when you talk about this um, deal of um, Oh, telling people that they have to have salvation before you die. Right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You don't think that it's a power grab in there at all, do you? No. <laughs> no not too much of a power no. grab in there. Because if I, if I, I do that, then, then what I say has power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, ju I just think that the... Also, that just comes. But people really believe that. I grew up yeah. being told that. Like yeah. I remember asking my mom once, why it's not okay to commit suicide, and she was like, because you don't have a chance then to ask for forgiveness. And at the time, my little girl mind was like, oh okay, yeah right. But now I'm like, well, so does everyone ask for forgiveness for everything they did wrong the second before exactly. they die? Exactly. I don't think no. so. No, I don't think so either. And of course, that's sort of the last rites in Catholicism mm -hmm. and things like that is mm -hmm. because the priest has this unbelievable amount of power to yeah. to come in and, and to do something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, Which mm -hmm. takes the power to the church, yeah. to the... To mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. So, I'm, I'm going to close with a thought. Okay. Um, is the... The community that Jesus wanted to create, Can I put that was egalitarian, that was embodying his message, that was learning how to melt their hearts into being more compassionate and seeing the world more in the way he, see, he sees it, did that get skewed and or do what most people just want is someone to tell them what to do? Mm -hmm. And both. Yeah, I think it's both. Yeah. I think that even what I said in the sermon today, it was just like, I'm not doing anything when I forgive your sins. I'm simply mm -hmm. proclaiming what already is. I have no power. Mm -hmm. And any one of us could do the same thing. But for some people, that's scary because they'd rather come to a place where people know more and the structure know more and be told what to do and what to think. Mm -hmm. And that feels secure, and I'm not mm -hmm. in any way blaming them. That's where they are in their life and development. Mm -hmm. I 
just think for those where that's too small and we want something more, we want healing, we want transformation, um, the church shouldn't get in our way. And that to me is, is the biggest thing is I'm slowly getting past the need of approval from anyone <laughs> with my understanding of God yeah. and Jesus as it's developing. Because to me, if it frees me and it makes me feel more like myself, how could that be wrong? Unless you're hurting yeah. other people. Yes. 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 Right. That's right. the ultimate litmus test. If yeah. it's yeah. people, it's definitely not godly. Right. And then mm-hmm. I also feel like if it's hurting other people genuinely, it's not really freeing me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because sort point. of the, the law of the universe is we all rise together and we all mm-hmm. are enslaved together. And so when one person is freed, it, it, it gives... It's like a light turns on and other people see it and their light might turn on, right? Mm-hmm. This is the light of mine. Exactly. <laughs> well, what'd you say? This is the light of mine. Yes, the absolutely. Light of mine. Yeah. yeah. We're not we don't come to church to confess what a worm we are, so maybe <laughs> if we confess hard enough, God might forgive us. I think we come to be reminded we have a light and to put some gasoline on the light. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah, we don't. We, 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 like, oh, the church is full of hypocrites, you know, duh, duh, you know, of course. And then, and I like that, you know, so we can come to get recharged our batteries so we can go out and not show people how great we are, yeah. but to take our love out and, and use it to help and make the world a better place. Yeah. I don't. People. I don't need people look at me going, "Wow, hey, he's really something." <laughs> because okay, so when they do that, then you know, yeah. they, they, if I if I let them have that power, then I also give uh, them the other power. Uh, that's, that's it. Yep. That's it.